deviate a little bit. <laughs> I'd like to change this song on you. It's one everybody knows, I'm sure. But don't you just love the Lord? Isn't God so great? The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps Himself in light Darkness tries to hide Trembles at His voice Trembles at His voice how great Thou God, sing with me, how great Thou God, and all the see how great, how great is our God.
Hey, everybody. Did you already say hi to everybody? All right, you can do that again. So I asked him the question that all of you want to know. Why are you looking that way, man? How come you're not looking at everybody out there? He goes, i got to see the words, man. <laughs> yeah, when he was here with us the last time, it was just great. It was so fun. It was so, it was so funny. He had, he had got to a part of the song, and it, it, we've all done it, in, in conversations or something, and we lose our place. And so he had to look up over his shoulder to get caught back up. And so he figured this way. Just not going to give it the opportunity. I'm just going to make sure I'm, it won't look weird. So I, I had to ask him. And so were any of you wondering that? You guys all figured it out, right? See, we've gotten to know one another well enough that he's not going to be bothered by me even bringing all this stuff up. Now, the first time he was here after we had first met, I wouldn't have done that. But now we've done ministry stuff together. So, hey, I'm going to ask. So, anyway, y'all okay out there? All right. I want to, um, in all seriousness, bring you up to speed on something. I'm sure some of you know that uh, Pastor Roger from Long Beach, Roger Cochran, um, he had uh, a pulmonary embolism. And so, um, actually, he had even, he had coded at one point, and they got his heart started, and this was about a week and a half ago. And so tomorrow they're going to be doing the surgery early in the morning to replace a heart valve, but it's not one of the easy ones to get out. So they're going to have to crack his sternum and the whole thing. So they got to, ouch. And so uh, he had asked me to make sure that you guys all knew this, to be praying for him, and he appreciates the prayer. It was really kind of cool. Uh, he called this morning, and I just caught the voicemail before I came down the hall, so I couldn't call him back. But he was just calling and said, hey, let everybody know and ask him just to be praying for everything tomorrow. So uh, we'd be praying for he and for, uh, for Diane, his wife, and then Andrew and all the people that are going to be taking care of you know, church things for a while over at Long Beach. But um, if you don't know who Roger is, uh, Roger had been doing Sunday nights here for us uh, before we went to Israel the first time in 2014. And so uh, he did a couple of the books. He did Ezekiel and Daniel here for us. But he's also one of the two pastors that had signed letters uh, recommending me uh, to Calvary Chapel when we were going through the affiliations process. If you were here, gosh, it's coming up on six years ago, if you can imagine that. So anyway, uh, he's got a real special place in my heart. I really love him. He's kind of like a father in the faith to me, as Jack was, uh, somebody who I, I just really appreciate being around, and, and I'm thankful that God's kept him around. So if you will remember him in your prayer, it's going to be early tomorrow. Um, so that's what uh, is happening with him. Just wanted to bring you up to speed. And then, uh, again, reminding you tonight, Bruce will be back here with us tonight. We are continuing on through the book of Zechariah. We are at that incredible chapter where uh, Jesus is revealed uh, in, in uh, chapter 12. And even those uh, of his own people who put him to death will recognize him. They will look upon me whom they have pierced, is what the, the text says. So we're at that part of Zechariah tonight. But we will uh, leave some extra time. And uh, we'll have some uh, extended time of worship too. So looking forward to that. Uh, to, uh, for this, this morning, turn with me to John chapter 4. And... We are, uh, week three is, as we go through this particular text, and this is the woman at the well. And so uh, we were at the, the park right after he reveals himself, as she talks about knowing that the Messiah is coming, and he says, I who speak to you am he. And so he identifies himself. Needless to say, this has a profound effect on her, and we will uh, take a look at that. But it's an amazing thing that you see that, uh, unlike ourselves, most of the time, most people, we are pretty good about doing one thing at one time. But uh, here is Jesus doing multiple things, and he's the only one who really knows what's going on, but he's going to reveal it all. And so uh, we'll pick that up this morning. We will begin at verse 27. So uh, having turned there, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll look at our text. 
Father, we thank you for gathering us here this morning, and we're grateful that you give us the opportunity to come before you. You have promised that you will open our eyes to what's here in your word if we will avail, uh, avail ourselves to the teaching of your spirit, and so we do. We ask, Lord, that by your spirit you would help us to understand what we see in the text here, knowing that there is so much more than what we can even see with the eye not just her, but even to these days as well. As we look around, there are the things that our eyes can see, but we know that you are up to many other things. We pray, Father, that you would give us eyes to see these things and spiritual understanding in matters of life. We pray, God, that you would, again, by your word, open our eyes and understanding this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, so by this point, we have uh, already had a chance to take a look at the places where he has had this conversation with her. Again, most people would look at it, and uh, it's easy to just, by looking at the text, it was just this, this random you know, uh, occasion at a well. And so, of course, this man comes up to her, Jesus, and asks for the drink of water. And so, if you look at it from both perspectives, she is, is going to be looking at this as, well, let's talk about cultural norms. What is it you, a Jewish man, is asking of me a drink? And so she may think this is about thirst, but doesn't he know that he's breaking social norms? And let, you know, she wants to, at that point, kind of get into a, a bit of an argument about what is proper worship. And so these are the things that we've seen in the first couple of weeks. Now, of course, she, at, at one point in, in this, when he mentions about her status as far as her husband and all, she uh, realizes that this is kind of an uncomfortable thing and looks to divert attention from this. This is from her perspective. Now, again, from his perspective, it's a completely different thing. He's gone, as we would understand it, the Bible seems to give the impression that it would be on his way. But we also know that there are other ways you could look at this, that a man of, of rank or, if you will, of higher stature, he was recognized as a rabbi. Something about him certainly gave her that impression. And so it would be unusual for somebody who would be seen demonstrably as a rabbi to be going through this area. In fact, what uh, historians would, would tell us is that they are, there were ways around this. You would go the extra mile not to have to deal with the Samaritans. And so, of course, we know that this is her kind of feeling of this whole thing. You, a Jewish man speaking to me, a Samaritan woman, this was something she was kind of unaware of. And, of course, again, from his perspective, it is about seeing a person who has a deep and an abiding spiritual need, but then it's going to have the kind of ripple effect throughout this town. It's going to be a teachable moment for these people who are seeking him and wondering who he is. Definitely going to be a teachable moment for the disciples. And it is also, if we are careful, a teachable moment for us as well. So as he has this back and forth with this woman, of course, he speaks to her about a type of water that if she was to partake, she would never thirst again. And he speaks about this water that it has the ability to, to bring about everlasting life. And so as he says this, she's, uh, we looked at last week, okay, I'll, I'll hear you out on this. Where do I get this water? And so, of course, he does deal and confronts the idea of her situation. And so he says, well, call for your husband. But it shows that he has an insight, and that insight really has much to say to her, and it, it really triggers in her quite an interesting response. Now, again, as I had mentioned last week, and we're going to get to it right here in the first part of the text that we look at today, it would appear as though he had much more to say to her that this particular passage doesn't record, because as we hear at the beginning, the disciples went away to purchase some food and then to take care of their needs now that they have reached the town and relaxing and all the rest of it. Well, this discussion that he has with the woman would have lasted from what we have here not very long at all. But for them to do what they did, they still had to come all the way back and they see him still talking with her as they walk up. So my guess is that he had much more to say to her and it would appear as though that's the case from what she has to say. So let's look at the first few verses here. Verse 27 tells us, now at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So this is what's on their mind, but they don't want to confront this. They just think this is an unusual thing. And so it says, the woman left her water pot, went into the city, and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? 
So up come the guys. It shows you that there are two things going on. He still has this back and forth with this woman, but now here the disciples come in and both have their questions and there are things that he's going to do in both of these people or these groups of people. But it begins with him again coming into a place that was unlikely for him to have been and then he strikes up a conversation with kind of the last person you would expect at a place that would be kind of unusual. But of course it was just the ability or the, the circumstance if you will where he could begin to address all of these things. Let me make sure that I'm very careful about this as well. In this particular passage, John deals with it, the other Gospels don't. And I am convinced that part of the reason why this was taking place was not just for the people there, at, uh, uh, there in Samaria, but also for the disciples and then for the early church that this may very well have gone around and this story told. John is recounting it long after the fact, decades actually. But here we are 2,000 years later, still talking about the same episode, able to draw the same spiritual conclusions that we see that they can draw from it as well in Jesus' teaching. And so as he teaches them, so also this teaches us as well. Well, as it goes on, you'll see uh, that this woman, what she has to say, I want to focus on verse 29. It says, now come and see a man who told me things that I ever did, all the things that I ever did, and could this man be the Christ? So all these things, all that we know that he confronted her about was the situation of her husband's and her situation of the person that she was with currently. Now, that wouldn't have been all the things that she ever did, so there seems to be a bit more to it. And so what we don't have, it's not there, we can't speculate, but it certainly had a profound effect on her. But what I think is most important is that she says, come and see. And this is one of the first takeaways that we should have from the text here. And those of you in here who are believers, my guess is that if you think back in your time that you had heard people talk to you about the person of Jesus and your need for him, it may very well be that you heard it over the course of months or even years and you had rejected it or just, you know, we'll hear about this later. You have that kind of, we'll wait and see. But from the moment that he became real and you trusted him for your eternity, something changed immensely in your relationship with him. Things were open to your eyes that weren't open before. And if you're the type who is grateful for knowing your destination and knowing that you could have a relationship with the living God, the first thing that usually comes from that is that you want to make sure that you tell others. I want you to see what I've seen. I remember that in the early years when, uh, when my wife and I first got saved. We were excited about that. We brought people with us and didn't have the answers, but we said, you've got to come and see what's happening. And so we would bring people and just kept bringing them and bringing them. And here all these years later, that fruit still remains. And it's not because of anything that we had done. We were just mind blown at what God had done with us and the things that now were real to us. And we wanted other people to know as well. This is something you don't want to keep to yourself. And so here this woman says, you know, meet a lot of people, but this one is able to tell me about things that have been going on for my whole life. He had insight that no one else could know. And that's why she was able to say, could this be him? And he's already told her that he is. When she says, well, when the Christ comes, remember, that's what uh, we see in verse 25. The woman said, I know that when Messiah uh, comes, when he gets here, he will tell us all things. And then so Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Settles it, right? Well, not only did he have that testimony, it's, it's easy to go ahead and say something like that. It's an entirely different thing to show that you have an insight that no one would be able to have. And so this has this profound effect on her. So she says, come, see a man who told me all things. Now, verse 30, then they went uh, out of the city to come to him. So these are the people that she gives this report to. It's okay, well, let's go see him. She gives the invitation, come and see. And so they start to do that. Now, I love this. In verse 31, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. You're wearing yourself out here. So in the interval of time, when she goes away, up come the disciples. We've got the food that we went ahead to get. Why don't you take a moment for yourself and get something to eat? Now, of course, Jesus sees this as an incredibly teachable moment. And he's already had that with this woman, and I'm sure he knows that there's still things to come. But he has this interaction with the woman, and he knows that it's going to create questions in the disciples. Now, we know that from a lot of other times, Jesus would be walking around or talking with people, and he would even be able to tell them the things that were on their minds. So it's no doubt 
that these guys must have probably looked perplexed, and I have no doubt that he knows what they're thinking. Uh, should we ask him about why he's talking to this woman? Remember, that's what they're, they're talking. They marveled. Hey, he's talking to that woman. Why? But nobody dares ask him. Well, as we study through this book, we'll find out that they get over that fear a little bit later on. Then they start asking all kinds of goofy questions down the road. And, of course, Jesus being patient, we'll teach them at those times as well. But here he says this in verse 32. So he says to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Now, of course, this would cause a perplexity to them. And we know that because the next thing that they say, therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? So he says, I, I, I'm taking care of. I have food that you're not aware of. And they're thinking, okay, so did somebody bring him a pita while we were looking the other way, or what's the deal? And so, of course, he's wanting this to be an illustration to them. Remember what's taking place here. Jesus confronts this woman and reveals to her who he is, and the one thing that she may, although she may not understand all of it, cannot deny that he has insight in a way that she's never heard before. And it has such a profound effect on her that she goes away, she, she leaves the water pot there. Okay, so that means like, do you just stagger away from that? What just happened? But she ends up saying what she says to these people and they want to come and see. Now, while that's all going on, then Jesus is able to pull the disciples aside and say, let me explain to you what's going on here. Let me, let me make sure you understand. So then Jesus says, in verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So if ever there's the question, what is God up to? What does God want to do? You have a really good illustration of it right here. God is concerned about the spiritual condition of mankind. Now, unlike some, I am not of the one who subscribes to the thing that God will impose his will on people to make them decide one way or the other. He simply gives an invitation. And then the person is free to, to, to believe or to reject. And so here, the will of God, though, this is what we know. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And if anybody was wondering, well, what is his work? What was Jesus sent there to do? You're watching it. It was to go, I believe, out of his way to see a woman at a well and to make her understand her importance that God would single her out in the midst of all of these things, but knowing that it didn't have to end with her, then she is you know, obviously changed by this, so much so that she goes and finds other people in the city. You've got to come and see. Knowing that it has this incredible effect, and yes, he's also able to help the disciples to understand there's much more that's going on here than you may think. We are temporary people. We get stuck in our day-to-day -day of stuff, right? Anybody else have that? Sometimes so much so that we get so focused on the stuff of our day that sometimes we don't even realize that God is doing other things far outside of just what we are concerning ourselves with. God wants us to see things in a much larger picture. So we see in verse 35, Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white with harvest. Now, as we have, in times past, we've gone around to uh, places there in Israel when we've gone to see, and, and I'm of the opinion that, that uh, the Lord would use the imagery that he could see. And so he would use that. Again, the Sermon on the Mount kind of a thing, consider the birds of the air, the lilies of the field. I mean, he could gesture to those things. Or at Caesarea Philippi, when he says the gates of hell will not prevail. I mean, he could motion right to the gates of hell. It was something that they understood. So in this case here, too, as he says that the field is white with harvest, it's to them an understanding that when something is ready to be gleaned or when something is ready to be reaped or brought in, it would show all the signs that it had come to the place of maturity and that it should be brought in. Well, as he says this, what would be walking in the direction of them but the people that she was bringing to meet him. And this is exactly what he's talking about. He's not talking about a harvest of wheat or of grain or whatever they would have been growing. He's using that as an illustration in an earthly sense. And again, he does this all the time. He did this with Nicodemus. He's done it earlier in this chapter with this woman speaking about water, things that they would understand with their eyes and with their minds. But he's going to make this spiritual application. And so he says, the field is white, it's ready for harvest. And then he ends up saying this. And so, verse 36, 
He who reaps receives wages, and he gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows and another reaps. Now, as he sees these people coming towards him, what he's able to do to say to these guys, look, I'm not talking about just regular everyday things that you would harvest. He's obviously talking about souls. He's going to, uh, he's going to be able to, to use this as an illustration. And even if they're not getting it yet, they're about to because these people are going to come to him. And they're going to spend the next couple of days. Yeah, the disciples are going to be with him as these people say, please come and stay with us. We want to hear more about this. Now, we need to recognize that what God calls us to in this life is to be those who testify of who he is. And there is a great thing that you have in your way of testimony by you just showing your own life. Now, a couple of things implied with that. The life has to be in, in the, the process, if you will, of what we would call holiness or sanctification. I mean, you should be different than when you first got saved. Can we agree on this? You want to know that the, the closer that you get to him, the further that the world is in your rearview mirror. You're a different person than you used to be. Because it really helps if you're going to testify of what he's done in you personally. If people are able to say, yeah, I do remember what that person used to be like. And then you're able to say, and, and yeah, what I, whatever I am today, if there's anything that's of any usefulness, and if there's a real change that you can see in what I was and what I am, it's all because he's made that change. I'd be oblivious to my need for such a thing. He's the one who is changing me from the inside out. And so, as he refers to this, and as he talks to these people about this, look, just recognize that one sows, another reaps. It is something that in each of our lives, I'm hoping that we can remember that there were those people who ministered to us. And we heard them, perhaps. We listened. Sometimes we even walked away convicted. But there was that time when everything changed. And you came to an understanding of who he is. Now, again, I want to make sure that we're careful with the text that's here because this is really early on in the ministry. It's not as though a whole, a whole bunch of people have been witnessing to these people about Jesus. This is like right at the beginning of things. However, there were those who were testifying of one that would be coming. By this time, we already know that John the Baptist has been around. We know that he's been doing the ministry that he's been doing. We know that the scriptures testify. In fact, remember this woman's own words. The, we know this, that the Christ is coming. Well, how else would you know that unless somebody had testified? And unless there had already been something in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that would have told you such things were coming about. And so, at this point, here he's able to say, one sows and another reaps. If we fast forward these 2,000 years, again, we're supposed to be those people that are willing to testify. The sowing of seeds is the idea of testifying of the gospel, and the effect that it's had upon your life. And hopefully, when you do so, that people are able to say, yeah, there's obvious power behind what they're saying because look at who they are versus who they were. And so, in this case, I would suppose that the people that were here listening to this woman as she's trying to bring the rest of them to hear these same things, they must have noticed that there was something different about her even in this case. Now, let's remember, not read too much into the text. She wasn't at this place born again. She couldn't be. Jesus was still alive and, and doing all of what he was doing. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't died for her sin. She hadn't been cleansed that way, but she certainly believed something. And so, will I expect to see her in heaven? I have no reason to think not. And these people that we read about here, kind of the same situation. This was a life-changing event for her and for the people who were there as well. And I'll be honest with you, when I think about it this way, as much of what you're seeing here said is really intended for the disciples. Because this idea of one sowing and another one reaping, think about the work that happened through these men when Jesus left and sent his spirit and they were so changed. John among them. He's giving us this account decades after. And so this work that Jesus began continued in them. And again, if anybody has ever come to faith through anything that they wrote, just remember, these are the guys that were watering. These were the guys that were putting these things in print, and God is bringing the harvest. And so he says in verse 38, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So this is speaking, certainly, as they go down the road. Who knows? You don't ever really know what a person has heard before. 
You simply want to be faithful to the testimony that is in your own life. What has God done for you and in you and through you, hopefully? But how has God changed the course of your eternity, and can you articulate that? And if you can articulate it, are people able to say, that makes sense, I understand. Now that you say it that way, I'd never thought about it before, but yeah, there's something really different about your life. It's more than just saying that they're a religious person, as people love to throw those labels at us. Oh, you're religious, or whatever they like to say. Is there evidence to that? And so with these people, here he says, I send you out. And let's remember we're not just talking about the disciples, but this is throughout the generations since. What God gives us here is a very simple understanding that there are people who are in desperate need of knowing that Jesus loves them, knows that they, or that they can know that they can be reconciled to him no matter what and, and where they come from. No matter what they've done, this is something that God can reconcile in any human being. And we who know him are to be the ones who are willing to say so explaining what it is that, that brought us to faith, but then realizing it's a work of the Spirit. Look at verse 39. So many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Why? Because of the word that the woman had testified. And he told me, all that, when she said, he told me all that I had ever done. So her evangelism, if you will, was pretty effective. People came to an understanding. These are the ones that came with her. Hey, come and see this person. And it wasn't some you know, silly sideshow like we see, it was really, this woman's life was so impacted that she wanted others to see what she saw with her own eyes. And so, as we see in verse 40, so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And it says also in verse 41, and many more believed because of his own words. So what he began with this woman ends up extending to other people there in the town that she lived, and they came and they heard as well. Now, I, you've heard me say it a million times, I get stuff sent constantly to the church about how to build, about how to make the church bigger, about how to make sure, how to make sure every single seat in your sanctuary is filled. And it's all methodology. And it would change a lot about how we do the day-to-day -day of things around here. Of course, I, I kind of chuckle at them. They're, they're comical when I read it because, again, this is man programming a way to make the church full, and yet the Bible tells me that God added to the church those that were being saved. But notice that there is some part of this as well that, that is on the people who believe. Do you bring people with you? Do you say, and even if it's not that you grab them by the neck and bring them here, but maybe it is that you are sure that you bring them to a place where they can hear for themselves the truth of the gospel? Do you take them to the word yourself? Or do you just say, look, I don't have all the answers, but let me take you to a place where there are people like us, people with belief and people with an understanding of the word. Come with me. Let me, let me take you to this person, Jesus, whether, again, it's through the word or if it's around a fellowship of believers. And so... The work that God puts before us. Remember, it started with someone else. Very seldom are you going to run into the person who has never heard the gospel, never heard the name Jesus, has no working understanding whatsoever of who he is. Those people are just not around much. But that means that if they've heard it, but they've never come to an understanding, we are to continue that, that working until the time comes when they either get to the point of rejection or God brings that in. In either case... That is bringing them in. They will either accept or reject. And then look at what verse 42 says. So then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's pretty amazing stuff. Now again, he hasn't even begun to get to that part of the ministry where we see a lot of it in, in almost the adversarial sense, where there are people that are attacking the things that he is saying, looking to quiet him down, try to get the disciples to stop saying the things that they're saying. They haven't even got to that place of adversity, and these people already understand. This is not only the Christ. He's the one that is here to save the world. Think about this. When was the last time that you even used those kinds of ways of describing him? We've turned Jesus into the one that we see in the bookstores. And we don't think about, hopefully, we're, we, hopefully we, we don't get caught up in all that. What I'm hoping that we do is that we do describe him this way. 
Jesus, the Lord. He is the Messiah, the Christ. He is the Savior of the world. How do I know? Because he's the Savior of me. And he didn't come just to save me, but he came to save mankind from sin. That was done a couple thousand years ago. We can have that assurance that we can use that same kind of language to the people that are around us. What we know is that God will go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that the message gets through. And then he says to the disciples, those who believe in him, now you have a part of this as well. Just know that I send you out to continue the work that somebody else has probably already started. And it is the, the work of God through his Holy Spirit that brings that, thing to, that, brings that to a, a place of harvest or a place of reaping and bringing in. So we see it played out in these people here. We see it played out in the disciples and how he mentions it to them. And then to finish this all out, in a room like this, again, there are all kinds of people. There are those that are doing really well with the Lord, maybe you've been walking with him forever, and your, your life in him may be better than it's ever been at any time, which is fantastic. You're the kind of person that God wants to say, okay, well, don't just sit here doing nothing. It's time for you to, when you leave this place, look for the doors that God opens to go and share the good news. Now there may be some of you in here that just are kind of like the, you feel like one of the disciples all the time. I know he's saying something, I just always seem to not get it. And I won't ask for a show of hands on this, but we get to that place and just like, man, everything that it seems like he's doing, I'm the last guy to get the memo, right? So good, again, no show of hands, but we've all been there. But maybe you're in here this morning and you're more like the people of this place here. You've heard the gospel a number of times. You've never come to him and you've never been able to say, we believe that this is not just Jesus, the historical figure. We believe that this is the one who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, if you don't know him that way, just know that you're the, the one that the Lord was speaking to the disciples about. Just know the field is ripe. It's ready for harvest. People are being shown what their need is. Maybe you've heard the gospel so many times. And you certainly know your need, but there's still, for whatever reason, that thing that keeps you from coming to him and say, God, forgive me and cleanse me. However you say those kinds of things. And again, it just begins a lifelong process. But it comes with the, ne uh, the, the necessary recognition that you are needing him that you are needing to be forgiven, you are needing to be cleansed. So as we are dismissed this morning, I'm going to ask Bruce to come back up and we'll have a closing song. Consider what you are reading here. Again, if you've been here for all three weeks, just remember there is no such thing as just a random meeting. God doesn't just do things without any kind of forethought. Remember, he knows the ends from the beginning. Every single thing about us is known to him. And so for every person who ever hears the gospel, don't think just because you're sitting in a room with a bunch of other people that God doesn't want you to come to grips with what you've just heard and what you've been seeing over these last few weeks. When you look at this, you are in one of these groups of people. You're the disciples. You're the disciples that either get it or the ones that are still trying to get it. Or you're like those people that are saying, well, I know that somebody has said something, but I have to know this for myself. And so you come to him at the invitation of someone else who says, come and see. So when you come and see, then what happens? And all of you, every single individual here who's hearing my voice, you know where you are in this whole thing. Last thing I'll say, and then I'll ask Bruce to play a song for us. We'll have some guys coming down to, to pray with you. But as you consider this, are you in that place of saying, I'll come and see? Are you in that place of saying, can I actually look at this and say, when I think of Jesus, the Lord, the Savior of the world, the one who is the Savior of the world, and I know this because he saved me. If you're in that place today, then grow in your walk and your maturity in him. Be a disciple that he can use to send out into the field. But if you're in here this morning and you don't know him that way, he's calling to you using this whole section and showing how much he wants to do this in you, that he would bring you to this place, to hear these messages over and over as we work through this text. It always leads us to the same conclusion. He's the God who loves and he's the God who saves. Do you know him that way? Let's stand. I 
as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to people down here to pray with you and for you and just again as a simple reminder God calls people openly and you know again we're not one of the churches that likes to do big altar calls and all the rest of that simply we're at the place of just saying God makes these things very very clear each person can hear the word for themselves and determine where they are as far as their walk is concerned are you ready if you were to see him right now is that a fearful thing to you or is it a, yeah, I'm about ready for that. I'm ready to see him face to face because of everything that he promised. The world's not getting any better, if you haven't noticed. It seems to be getting more messed up by the day. If your hopefulness is in this world, then your hopefulness is futile. Because this is not going to continue as it's always continued. The day's coming when he returns again. And then the question is, are you ready for that day? So, as we're dismissed this morning, sincerely... Come down if you have questions about what's been shared. If you've never trusted him, and again, if he's not the savior of you as an individual, you can settle that today. He calls you openly so you can come down. If you have other needs of prayer, then feel free to come on down. We'll, we'll pray with you if you have needs of healing, any of the rest of those things. Let's bring it before the Lord and trust him for what he'll do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the challenge that we find in it. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to use up the opportunities that you put before us. Those who know you, that we would be faithful, that we would go into these places that you send us, whether it's watering, whether it's reaping, whichever it may be, God, would you help us to be vessels, usable in your hands. And I pray for those who are here this morning, any who don't know you, if they can't look at you and think Savior of the world because you are the Savior of them, God, that you would free them, bring them to this place this morning, that they would acknowledge that need, come to you and seek you for that, that counsel, seek you for that comfort, and seek you for that peace of eternal life as you offered to her and to these people that we read about this morning. God, we thank you. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.